Well, good morning and welcome to the last PLSA webinar of, of 2020, um, presented and hosted by our education partner, Bloomberg. The uh, subject of the webinar is Vision 2030, Technological Insights for Pension Funds of the Future. There'll be a, a panel session and, and some presentations, both of which will give you the opportunity uh, to submit questions. So please do that during the course of the webinar um, by uh, submitting your questions in the Q&A box. And your comments are obviously also very welcome. So please do use that functionality as well. Um, as I mentioned, Bloomberg is our education partner with PLSA. We're proud to be working with them. This is the second of their um, webinars. The, uh, the previous webinar um, is available on our website. Um, but for the purposes of those that maybe aren't so familiar with, with Bloomberg, their professional services, including their data terminal, their uh, data management integration services, provide real-time data, breaking news, in-depth research, and powerful analytics to help um, financial profession professionals, I should say, make smarter, faster, and more informed decisions. So I hope you enjoyed the, the session. I will briefly now hand over to Sonia, who will conduct the first part, and then it will be followed by a presentation by David Strevens, uh, followed by further Q&A, and then I'll be making some closing comments. So thanks very much for registering. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Adrian. Good day, everyone. Sonia Ramata here. I work as a buy side relationship manager and EMEA asset owner lead at Bloomberg. I'm thrilled to co-host the second webinar as part of our educational partnership with the PLSA. As Adrian mentioned, most people know Bloomberg for the terminal offering of market data, news and analytics. And you can see that on the next slide. However, the terminal is really the portal into the technology, infrastructure and financial community that are assisting firms globally to reach enterprise-wide goals. The role of technologies for, technology for pension funds specifically is an important conversation and one we want to have now to really unpack how exactly can this be applied to safeguard and plan for the future. Now, technology is a broad term and it can mean different things depending on where you sit within the pension fund. This could be the technology you use to interact and engage with your beneficiary and sponsors. It could be the technology you use in the investment process for your internally managed funds, or it could also be the technology used to have oversight on your externally managed funds. For today's session, we're gonna focus on the investment processes for internally and externally managed funds. At Bloomberg, when we embark on a technology journey with our clients, we often go through a few phases together. On the next slide, you will see three examples of these phases. Now, every client is different, but we're gonna chat about these three. Often we start with a catalyst. This could be a C-suite change, a merger or a demerger that reinforces the need for technology or it could just be emerging challenges that are so grave that it triggers a technology review. Following the, the catalyst, there's the scope of the technology solution. Here, lots of time is spent deciding what technology is going to be used to solve each of the challenges. And then finally, the implementation of the solution. If you ask anyone, that's my favorite but you do not have to take my word for it. We have two great panelist speakers that are gonna share their insights from their technology journey. So let me go ahead and introduce them. We have Fiona Miller, Chief Operating Officer of Border to Coast Pension Partnership. Fiona joined Border to Coast at inception as Chief Operating Officer, Executive Director from Cumbria County Council, where she managed the local government pension scheme as well as various financial functions. Fiona has more than 25 years of experience in finance and a focus on change and organizational design. Welcome, Fiona. Our second panelist is Howard Brindle. 
Howard was appointed Deputy CEO for USS Investment Management in March 2018, after having been appointed Chief Operating Officer in March 2012. Howard has previous, was previously head of JP Morgan's European Transfer Agency product and Chief Administration Officer of Lehman Brothers Asset Management Europe. Welcome, Howard. So let's kick off with our first question for our panelists. Can you share the technology journey at your firm? What was your catalyst? Fiona, would you like to start first? Yeah, I don't know how many of your um, attendees understand, but the local government scheme um, is 89 funds in England and Wales, ranging from a billion pound to 30 billion. And the government set as a challenge to actually consolidate the assets of those pension funds. So what Border to Coast is, is the investment arm effectively of 11 of those partner funds who under them have 50 billion in assets. So we took our first assets in July 2018 and we're now managing excess of 20 billion with another um, 15 to 20 to come on board at current prices. So massive growth, but the catalyst was um, government governance announced change and driven driven at that sort of strategic level. Howard, how about you? What was your catalyst at USS? Uh, thanks, Sonia. Um, well, I guess I joined USS eight years ago um, and USS Investment Management. Uh, we were about £35 billion pounds under management and uh, a mixture, mostly internal investment management, but some external management. And we were looking to be more sophisticated and take more control around our asset allocation decisions. Um, I think the first problem to solve as an asset owner is what assets do you own? And if you don't know that, you can't make asset allocation decisions. We were running that on a spreadsheet at the time. Um, which was creaking at the seams. So um, we had to find a solution for that. I think um, at the time we looked for outsourced partners to provide a solution, but the asset owner space, I would say, is more underdeveloped than the asset management space, at least for technology solutions. We were um, a big Bloomberg user um, for our internal positions, um, but we were trying to put everything through that platform and we were really struggling um, with that and with, with spreadsheets. So we um, set about building our own investment book of record platform. Um, it's much easier on a greenfield site to build things um, because you don't have the old spaghetti to rip out. Um, so you can move a lot faster in that um, space. Um, obviously though, everything you build or buy, you have to glue together. And that's been the challenge for us going forwards and, and, and now we're in the space where we understand the assets that we have and the value of those assets, but we want to understand them better. We want to understand the duration of our fixed income assets. We want to understand the relationship with our liabilities and how we manage that. We want to understand the carbon footprint of our equities portfolio, the risks of private markets, assets that we own. So there's a lot more that we need to do around the data, but, the, but I think the starting point was getting a handle on what exactly is it we own as an asset owner. Great. As we continue the conversation around technology, let's do a check in with our audience members with a polling question. If we can have the polling question come up. Lovely. So the question is for our audience members, where do you see the biggest upside for pension funds leveraging technology? So just select your answer and submit. Is it within asset allocation? manager selection, asset liability management, reporting, or all of the above? Can we see the answers? Great, I, sus I suspected many of our audience members will choose all of the above, but second to all of the above, we have asset liability management, interesting. Fiona and Howard, you shared a wide range of challenges in your first answer, and this polling question shows that different stakeholders can have different views of where the most value lies for technology. How do you prioritize what challenges to solve for first? You want me to go first? Go for it. Um, I mean, it, it, for us, we were in the very fortunate position of having a clean slate. So, you know, Howard's 
terminology of spaghetti we were really lucky we didn't have that and we took it with gusto um, the chance for a, an operations process person to build something from scratch with clean technology is few and far between so for us it was where can we get the most bang for our books the um, most development opportunities and where can we really focus the internal attention on what adds most value and we took a decision early doors to use established technology a few what we would call strategic partners um, to work with so rather than having loads of bespoke systems that take lots of maintenance and continual attention to really um, leverage the relationships that we could build and through to through processing so to Howard's no spreadsheets not lots of reconciliation data processes absolutely clean through to through processing um, and that was where we really focused attention there was some early discussions. I mean, I can remember one about brokerage um, and the investment man, oh, we need to do brokerage internal. And when I challenged that, well, you've got MIFID coming up, you've got regulatory reporting, you've got a whole change in the, what is it that you get? Um, and this is the financial benefits from not doing it. Mm. They agreed to change the process and actually that's worked really effectively. So, so I would say challenge challenge established norms and really prioritize what it is that you add value by doing internally and the rest of it look to find a good partner that you can work with that can take the regulatory the investment um, technology burden which is only going to increase over the next few years i think you're definitely in a fortunate position to to start with the clean slate how about you howard i suspect it was a different prioritization strategy well, I, th I think as, a, as an asset owner, um, yeah, you have to prioritise, as Fiona said, the things that are of, of greatest value. And I think for us, um, the risk on um, an external manager's active risk positioning versus the, the risk on a fundamental asset allocation decision, um, the asset allocation decision is much, much bigger. So we have to look at the bigger picture. And so for us, we really focused on being able to get a clear and accurate picture of, of, of the entirety of the assets that we own, rather than focus on particular pockets of it. We were quite lucky, we did use, our, 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 I won't plug for the sake of it, Bloomberg, but we were using Bloomberg front to back and simplicity with technology, I think is key and king. And there are a lot of advantages to the Bloomberg platform, not having to run it yourself, um, always being on the latest version. Um, and, and having a single platform front to back that helped us to give that, put all of our assets, all of our entire portfolio through the platform. And that, that really helped us build our investment book of record. I think the other thing that we look at as a pension fund is the longer term picture on this. Um, we make success over a five year period. Um, we try not to look at daily or monthly performance. We don't always succeed in that, but uh, um, we are trying to look at the bigger picture and make decisions for the long term. And I, and I do think that um, that means that you can, you know, pension funds are privileged. We don't have the same commercial pressures as an external investment manager. You, um, if you have an idea to spend one pound to save two pounds, then you can do it because you're, you're sitting on a big pension fund. But with that responsibility, um, you have to take that very seriously. And I think um, for most pension funds, the challenge isn't about spend decisions and so prioritization not necessarily around spend, but more about change capacity and the ability mm -hmm. of, the, of the people and, and the, of the organization to, to do everything. It's not possible to do everything that you would like to do. So you still have to be disciplined around prioritization and make those decisions for the long term. Change capacity. I was gonna say, I would absolutely echo that. I mean, I would say our biggest challenge was how did we prioritize what came in in what order? Mm. Um, so starting with internal management to external. So we didn't take in um, the biggest AUM products to start with. We took in the products that would add the most value and give us the resource to develop other products out. So there is real prioritization calls to be made when you do any change. They will be different to different organizations, but understanding that prioritization route and being flexible throughout it um, and working for us with our partner funds over that journey has been caught actually how we've managed to progress at the speed and efficacy that we have even given 
a new organisation. We've recruited 30% of the workforce in lockdown um, and a third of our time in since inception has been in lockdown. So you, you can do it, but you do need clear prioritisations and you need to be able to review those prioritisation calls throughout. Lovely. Sounds like it's a moving part and continuously needing to review. And with that being such a critical part, that's what's needed to scope the solution. And so that's often a phase we, we engage with our clients on. I don't see any questions in our Q&A uh, spot just yet. So I'm going to share another polling question with the audience. So as we prioritize our challenges and we begin to scope the solution, what do you think is the biggest challenge for pension funds when scoping a technology solution? So once again, select your answer and submit. Is it deciding whether to build versus buy, choosing the vendor or technology partner, the cost of maintenance, or ensuring the pension fund team actually adopt the new technology? Can we have a look at the results? Wow, uh, a tie on choosing the vendor and technology partner and ensuring that the pension fund team actually adopt new technology. Um, I wonder if there was any surprise on, on these answers here. Thank you, audience. Back to our panelists. In your experience in scoping solutions, what are some of the obstacles that you came across and how did you solve for these? Shall how I go would you want to go? Okay, yeah, thanks. round robin, nice. <laughs> well, I think, you know, we're not a technology firm, so you should always look to buy rather than build if you can, um, because um, if somebody's built it, they will have done better as a professional software agency than, than we will have as a pension fund. I think the biggest challenge is that the, the asset owner space for investments is, compared to asset management, a lot more underdeveloped. There are a lot more less solutions in, in, in the space. I think that that is improving at a rate of knots and actually... I think if we were beginning our technology journey now, we'd be able to uh, buy a lot more than we build. I still think that one of the lessons that we've learned is that even if you buy all the solution, you still need technology capability in-house yeah. to glue it all together and to make sure it works effectively. And there isn't one system that does everything out there, uh, not even Bloomberg. So, um, you know, you will be looking at multiple specialist systems to deliver what you want. And you do need to have a strong technology capability behind it. And the more systems you have, the harder it is to make change, the more focus you need on things like data architecture and making sure that you're not having to rip out things or re-implement things that you've implemented before. So the more technology you have, the harder it is to make a change in that space. So be thoughtful about what you want to do um, and, and just recognize that while you might be off to a fast start initially, if you've got a greenfield site, it will get progressively tougher and you, and you have to be progressively more thoughtful. Um, so I think, I think that those are some of the challenges uh, in this space. Fiona, does that resonate with you? Yeah, it's back to do what you're good at, as, as Howard said. <clears throat> but I think it's also, excuse me a minute. <clears throat> it's also understanding the changing environment. So, you know, the increasing regulatory and technology environment, you know, if the last nine months hasn't told you anything, if it hasn't taught you that your infrastructure platform is as key to anything else you're going to do, I'm really not sure where you're going. So that resilience, using scale, using others, developing it is, is just core to where the business will be going over the next few years. Um, and Howard mentioned, you know, you, it's very rare to find one provider that solves all of your challenges. And so having open technology, Fiona, we spoke about how perhaps the relationship that all of the technology partners for the pension fund, there's scope for, for, for us to work together as well. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I was very clear we were doing this with limited knowledge scale resources or time. Um, so. I talk about strategic partners and I genuinely mean that, you know, the, the people that we select are long term contracts, we spend a lot of money with them. But I don't expect I don't just expect them to work well with us, I expect them to work well and seamlessly with my other providers. Um, and that was a 
big decision making in our process. How did it link? How did the technology open up? But also how did the firm work with other providers to make sure that I wasn't the person in the middle trying to sort out when something didn't flow through, that they would work openly together to, to address problems, to work on new problems and to work with me on what I needed to develop. So um, understanding all of your providers and how they work together is absolutely key to this. Lovely. Many of us uh, who have undergone a technology implementation know that a solution is only as good as it's implemented. And the implementation, ensuring that there's a good implementation is critical to the effort and the investment put in. For our panelists, where do you see the challenges around implementing new technology solutions? And how does this affect the, the partners you choose with? Uh, you choose to work with. And just picking up on what we mentioned earlier, the flow of data across different systems seems that that would be something that you consider. What do you think? Yeah, totally agree. Um, the more technology footprint you have, then the more thoughtful you have to be about introducing new systems into that and how they interact and what data they're getting and from where. But but even with the first few systems that you're putting in, uh, um, you need to make sure that they're open systems it's no good if they're closed systems they're hard to get data out of because you're going to need it you know whether it's esg reporting requirements or uh, if you want to do further enhanced asset liability management analytics um, you're going to need access to the data um, and you need to work with systems that, that have robust mechanisms for getting data into and out of those systems in order to work i think because there isn't one system that that covers everything and it's not acceptable to have a closed system or proprietary interfaces anymore in this space. I think that, yeah, you have to have open standards in that and you will need your own technology capability or some technology capability bespoke in order to glue those things together. Um, but yeah, getting data into and out of these systems is probably the biggest challenge that we face. I think I would add as well, um, what we have is a very, very robust, very detailed operating model across everything. So not just the technology, but the processes and the controls that underlie that. So when we seek to make a change or an adaption or add on to our um, technology, it's really clear what it's going to change, what it's going to affect, what it's going to hit, what we need to control, what we need to manage through you really need to have that robust operating model to manage the level of change and efficacy that you need to get out of these. Um, you know, if, if you have two systems and you're looking to, to glue them together or data flows, if you don't understand what those data are flowing in and out of, um, you end up with some very bizarre operational results and some very poor decision making if you're not clear. So that really clear, well-documented, well-understood operating model because one thing none of us have is a lot of resource to do this. Mm. So you need to make sure that when a person in one area of your business, so the investment risk team, I need this bit of software, I need this bit of capability, they really need to know what it's going to do if they change their bit and how it's going to affect the rest of the organisation. Mm. Do you have an opinion on sort of which part of the pension fund operations is most difficult to implement? I'll leave that one to Howard since I'm slightly different to a true pension fund. <laughs> I, th I think uh, the people that, that sit at the back end of all of this data, so for us, it definitely is the risk team. So they need to get all the data from all the different sources upstream and get that in a coherent fashion with all the detail that they need um, at an aggregated level is, is a tremendous challenge. Um, and converting your positions from a futures position to understand the, the equity beta of that through to fixed income, understanding the duration of it, private markets, what are the risk factors, and getting all of that in some sort of sensible format. If you want to make um, more sophisticated risk analytics and decision making based on that, um, then I think that, that that would be the biggest challenge for us. I would echo Fiona's point that architecture is key. I used to hate those operating model documents, <laughs> like the old big dusty shelves that, that got out of date within two years and then eventually got thrown away. Yeah. I do think that technology has helped us in that space as well with things like Confluence, um, or online wiki style documentation that makes it much more living and much more practical and easy to use and, and easy to update. Um, so I think if you, you, you we need to, 
continue not just to um, look at new technology systems for pensions, but also the support tools and framework around it are evolving as well. Nice. And, and then a follow up on the implementation. What are some of the mistakes or lessons learned uh, along implementation that you can share with some of the audience members? I, I, I think from our perspective, we, we underestimated how much support we would need in everything that we built. So we moved quickly at first because we were, you know, just replacing spreadsheets is very easy to do. Yeah. But, but the more you layer on, the harder it is to make that change and the more technology resources you're going to need in order to make that change. So you have to be really thoughtful about what you want to do. And we suddenly found that our team that had been doing 75% development was now doing 75% support, maintenance, keeping the system up to date. Wow. Um, and, and our change capacity had, uh, had dramatically reduced as a result. So, so everything that you build, you really need to be thoughtful about, do you want to build it? But even when it's stuff you buy, they, they, nothing ever comes off the shelf these days. And, and it does require a hell of a lot of work to configure, maintain and glue together with everything else. So don't underestimate the, that if you're going to go on this journey, that, that, that it's not easy. Uh, um, one of the things I've learned is that the, the quality of people is, is key. Um, I would rather choose one top developer over three mediocre okay. um, every day of the week, somebody who actually understands the business um, and, and understands different technologies. So I think, um, yeah, you should always choose quality over quantity, um, but not underestimate the size of the challenge. Um, Sorry, Howard, was that people you hire within USS? Or yes. the yeah, people? Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, we try and hire the very best. We don't, you know, we're, we're lucky in that we're able to, um, make that decision and and uh, um and so yeah we, we we do try and hire really good people because we feel that it works a lot better and, and we want to be nimble and we want to still say not too big we're now 160 people in investment so we so we're a lot less nimble than we used to be that's for sure yeah. um but yeah i do think that quality trumps quantity every day i would definitely agree with that with howard i mean we, we you know we built this thing and, and went operational with um, 20 staff. Um, so in six months, so you can, but you need to rely heavily on your partners. You need to have the right people. What I would say as we continue to develop and are now you know, a well-established multi-asset manager, you need to understand how much capacity people have got for change and how quickly you can take them along. You know, we were lucky that even the staff that we tupied across, this was completely new, new systems, new process, new, new enterprise, new organization. So they came with some baggage, but not somebody that sat at the same desk for several years doing the same job on the same computer. Taking your incumbents with you so that actually gets embedded rather than just going to the industry, getting great consultants and everything that can design you a nice flashy front end, but when you switch it on, it's just not great to use, doesn't work how the team want it to, doesn't give them the information. You've really got to take your core staff with you on this journey mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, they're the guys that will or won't switch it on. And it's that simple. Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree with that. I think when we're doing the budgeting and, and, we, and we look at our change budget, if I was to budget based on what people wanted to do, then our change budget would probably be three times the size of what it actually is. Um, so a lot large percentage of the time, you know, our budgeting process is around how much change do we think this organization can actually absorb effectively, efficiently? Do we have the skill sets, the people that understand the business to make that change effectively? Um, and that that is a limiting factor on what we can achieve within our business, I think. Um, how much can we grow organically efficiently and effectively rather than how much money do we have to spend on this stuff because um you know pensions are in a privileged position in that perspective um and it's always easy you know with, a, with an 80 billion fund we have a we have an outperformance target of 50 bips which doesn't sound a lot but that's 400 million pounds a year and so that will buy you a lot of change resource to deliver that that outperformance target but the and the prize is big but you do have a duty to make sure that you deliver it effectively and efficiently. And I think, um, yeah, the, the growth and, and making sure you bring people on that journey and you don't, you don't blow this thing up by trying to do too much is, is the most important thing. Hmm. 
it, it came across that the, the role of data uh, is really important and having a robust operating model and the right people in. Are there specific data sets that, that you think about or is important for, for pension funds? And you can speak from experience at your, at your firms. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, I taught our, our, our starting point is our investment book of record and our investment data and, and making sure that that's accurate and up to date every day is important for us. Once we've got that, then you can then convert that, transform it into risk data. Um, you, we're now starting to look at liability data and how the assets and liabilities interact. We're looking at ESG data and how can we get an ESG view on this and other different market data. So, so there's, all, there's loads of different um, data sets. And I think um, that's the challenge really is picking what, 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 what are key, but you know, starting with investment data is always a good starting point but mm -hmm. as i say having that infrastructure so you can overlay other data later on is important um, yeah i would agree with how it, what we call and what most call golden source having a single source that everything spars off is absolutely key you're not spending your time trying to justify one data set against another and how that book of record flows through to your risk data your esg your performance analytics um, that is what drives the decision making. But if you've not got a clear golden source that's consistent and um, well managed, well understood, the rest of it all hangs off the edge and you spend your life trying to justify why it doesn't agree to that golden source. So for me, that flow through, that clarity of, of the linkage is core. It saves you so much time and effort. Yeah. And it makes what you do with your final decision making effective. Thank you. So we coming up to our final question, unless there are any questions within our Zoom chat, I will, I will watch it if any comes up. But as a final question from me, why go through all this trouble? It sounds like it's a lot of work and it's expensive. What is the impact of exploring and ensuring the right technology is applied to a pension funds operating model? I mean, for us, it, it it was quite simple. We were being offered the opportunity to pool large sums of money to deliver material benefits, both to our members and because of the way the local government is funded to local taxpayers. This was about professionalising, streamlining, cutting costs. You know, nobody can uh, get away from the fact that there was a big imperative for pooling to deliver savings. But for our pool particularly, we were always clear, this wasn't just about cost. It can't be about cost to Howard's point previously. This is about better risk adjusted long-term returns. Um, and for that, you need clear, clear data analytics and technology supporting it. Yeah, Thank you. I, I always think it's um, a scale game with pension funds. Um, if I was less than 10 billion on a pension fund, I wouldn't do this. I would try and uh, avoid getting into all of this because I think that the, the benefits to doing internal management and, and having that oversight and so on are hard to deliver unless you've got real scale. But once you once you get to to larger scale, then you know you assess our investments. Um, the 160 people we have in London office are 12 bips on our fund in terms mm -hmm. of cost to run that entire infrastructure uh, and assess it and. Um, yes, we, are ha we do outsource maybe about 20% of our investment management to external managers. That costs us twice as much. That costs us 24 basis points for that small piece externally. So you can see the benefits of scale of having 160 people dedicated to a single fund, costing only 12 basis points, being able to invest across public, private markets, every single asset class. You know, that's, that's why we do this and why we build this infrastructure is to to not rely on external management, which is undoubtedly, um, or historically has been a lot more expensive. I do think there's an interesting dynamic in the investment management market with um, a lot more scale and um, costs going down on, on the big external managers and, and the ability to implement um, light to touch, uh, you know, ETF strategies, whatever, um, that will see that margin of, of, of the internal um, business case erode slightly, I'm sure, but I still think that the benefits of having 160 people dedicated to delivering a single goal and making long-term decisions and in integrating ESG into those long-term decisions um, is is more than just cost. It's, it's alignment with the 
the members that you have that you get as well. So I think there will always be a market once you're at scale for internal. And, I, and in order to do that, you need a technology capability to underpin it. I mean, I was just looking at the question that's come in on ESG. Exactly. And to Howard's point, um, internal management, we feel really helps what we can do to drive ESG. Um, because it, it, it's then embedded right through your core investment process. And while we spend a lot of time working with the managers we select and, you know, it is core to who we select that they, they develop our ESG principles, that internal management definitely makes this area easier. It is difficult. The data is still developing in this area, benchmarks and things, um, carbon footprinting. I would say it's a merging area and you've really got to be really careful about the data that you select and how you use it. Um, but that it's fundamental to what we do at Border to Coast is, is, not, is not an issue. It's just being really selective about what you do, how you do it, how you implement it, how you communicate that implementation. And that longer term approach is absolutely key here um, to move the transition of the market. Yeah. Don't know what your views are, Howard. Howard, yeah. do you see the question? Yeah, the, uh, um, I think well, we've always had um, like a six, seven person responsible investment team, like full time on ESG issues. One of the things that I do see, though, is that the, the skill sets of that team are, are having to evolve. Um, it used to be about governance and voting. And now it's, it's all those things as well. But now it's uh, quantitative and more analytical. And I think um the gap between you know of, of how you figure out how you integrate ESG is definitely becoming closer to the quant world um and so you know we we are reskilling and and hiring more people with specific quant skills into that area um because again you know the data and, and how you use that data is becoming much more important and so I do think that the the RI team of the future will have a different look in terms of skill set to how it has been historically but it is key. Uh, you were, we have to pay these pensions for the next 50 years. So, of course, we need to understand what, what's going on with global warming. The whole reason why we do private market assets is for the G yeah. and ESG, the governance and alignment between what you're investing in and your goals. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a cornerstone of what we do. OK, we have another question. I think maybe perhaps we'll take one more question. Um, my answer to that was really easy. The scale of this, um, it was a full public procurement. Um, we are bound because we're wholly owned by local government um, ent entities. We're subject to public procurement. Um, so for all of our major suppliers and outsourcers, it, it was a full RFP public procurement. And I would say we use specialists to help us draft that procurement, score it and implement it. And there was a lot of value for us um, in using that external third party that really understood the market and the linkages between the systems. So I wouldn't shy away from using a third party to help you select another third party, if that <laughs> makes sense. I, I actually agree with that. We're lucky we don't have to follow the full public procurement processes. So we don't have to do 100 page RFPs, but a lot of these third parties, you know, for things like custodian, they have an RFP straight off the shelf or for the technology provision. And so trying to do all that yourself, well, you'd be crazy and you wouldn't have necessarily the perspective that those third parties would have who are dealing with the industry and knowing it all the way through. So even though we don't have to follow uh, the same uh, prescribed processes we do would do a, a formal rfp process one of the nice things of working with a pension fund though is that we're not in competition with each other so we do talk as pension funds who's good who's not what are the issues what do you need to worry about and so i would 100 percent be doing that at the same time and probably have in fact i always do will have an opinion of who i think is going to win the rfp before we go through that process but uh, you know it's worth going through it because it's not, I've not always been right on that opinion and uh, yeah. I had my mind changed along the way. So yeah, I do think uh, using a, an, a, an appropriately skilled third party and there are some very good, strong third parties out there to help you with this, I think. Howard and Fiona, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time and your, your valuable insight. Um, I think a strong narrative has emerged that technology can help pension funds uh, achieve some of their goals. I am now going to hand over to David Strevens.
Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sonia. And again, thank you very much to Fiona and Howard for uh, for being there to go through that panel discussion. I think it was incredibly informative for all. Um, so as Sonia says, my name is David Strevens. I'm responsible for the group that looks after all of Bloomberg's enterprise buy side products um, in EMEA. Um, so that's really everything that we provide to the whole spectrum of buy side clients, whether it be the asset owners, the asset managers, the sovereign wealth funds, the hedge funds, et cetera. Um, and that really goes across kind of two to three key verticals is the order management systems that we have, and then also getting into the risk and performance engines that Bloomberg provides out to its clients. Now, what I'm going to do is really share with you over the next 10 minutes or so some of the thoughts that are on our mind, which thankfully very much builds on a lot of the commentary that you've just heard from Howard and Fiona. Um, and then I'm also just going to articulate a couple of things that we're very much kind of focused on at Bloomberg as we continue to build out the buy side solutions for the futures um, so that we continue to meet the evolving needs of the asset owner. Um, and that really is going to be the kind of central focus of what I'm going to talk about. So when we kind of sit here as a business kind of looking ahead, these are really the kind of three key themes that are very much on our mind. Um, and as I say, as I heard that kind of conversation over the last 40, 40 minutes, these are all things that we continuously heard through that discussion. Now, data to us gets broken down into two different ways. We think about data, first of all, exactly as, as Howard articulated a few times around kind of how do I get a clean version of my eyeball? How do I create that true, decent, golden copy of data that I then use throughout the organization? How do I make sure that my duration number is being calculated in the same way for what risk is looking at through to what the portfolio, might, portfolio manager might be looking at to make that end decision? But the second thing of this is the world that we've all lived in over the last kind of decade or so, that data has just become so easily available to people. I think one of the big challenges that everybody is facing across the buy side is how they take that data and turn it into something that's meaningful. Um, and I'll talk about an example in a second that plays on one of the points that Howard made around kind of the carbon footprint of a portfolio, right? You're taking loads of different data sets to then actually try and run analytics on it. Now, the second thing to us is really around this kind of idea of efficiency. And we look at that in kind of three key ways. I think the industry is very much focused on the operating model, and that we've just heard a huge amount about. But how does technology enable a firm to be much, much more efficient? And then the third piece is around this kind of concept of outsourcing, right? Yes, a lot of firms are looking at kind of bringing more money management in-house, but are there other things that they can continue to outsource? Is that certain middle office workflows? Is that even, let's say, um, the, the trading function? Um, so all of these, I think, are things that many asset owners that are bringing money in-house are continuing to want to look at ways that outsourcing can be more effective to them. And then the final bit is how do firms continue to generate the profits that they want to be generating for their end clients, which in the case of many of these asset owners is, is obviously the kind of the pension uh, income that's coming off the back of it. Now, I think that's going to become even more challenged with the low interest rate environment that we obviously sit in today. Um, but there's that big kind of active versus passive debate. And then also the kind of continuing evolution of how much alternatives are coming into the play of what an asset owner does. Many of the different statistics that I think that we look at is that if you go back kind of 20, 30 years ago, alternatives, so away from the traditional kind of listed equity markets and public bond markets, alternatives represented kind of 2 to 3% of a portfolio. On average now, I think across most asset owners, you're at kind of 10 to 13%. So we're seeing a huge role that the alternatives is starting to play in that space. But if we just move on to the next slide, I'm going to get a bit more into kind of some of the more unique challenges, which again builds on a lot of the points that we just heard through that discussion um, with Howard and Fiona. Now, one of the big bits to us that we are very, very much focused on, and we've been working with a huge number of clients over the course of this year to help them solve for that, is how they get that much greater level of oversight of their portfolios, right? Firms want to be able to sit there and almost instantaneously build that view of, oh, what is my exposure to this specific company? Or what is my exposure to this specific sector? Um, because historically, to a lot of the stuff that Fiona and Howard were saying, firms sat there doing a lot of work in Excel, and data very quickly became out of date, or if you wanted to run kind of large complex modeling across it, it would become very, very difficult. So I think technology is actually leading to the asset owner wanting to have that much, much greater analysis of what either their end farm managers, if they're outsourcing, are doing, but also what people are doing internally as well. So that the firms, I think, are putting much, much more emphasis into the overall oversight of what a portfolio manager is doing. 
The second piece of that, I think, is around compliance. Um, firms are, or owners are wanting a much, much greater control of the overall compliance process that, again, either internal managers are doing or even their external managers. There's a number of pension funds that we work with where they're taking the transactions that have been done every single day by external managers, and they're wanting to make sure that they are meeting their overall requirements that they've put in place in terms of compliance. And then the final two bits on the, the oversight part is really around kind of market risk and then the broader piece of kind of liquidity and credit risk. I think there have been some examples over the last year that many of us have seen, e.g. what happened with the Woodford situation where I think many kind of uh, government-backed asset owners in the UK had significant exposure to the Woodford uh, portfolios. And that, again, I think is a key thing which is really driving that change in behavior of owners wanting to have that better insight into liquidity risk that might exist across the different exposures that they hold due to the multi-manager nature of how they operate. Then the final bit I'll just touch on on the screen, just in the interest of time, is really around the part of ESG. Um, now, it was fascinating kind of how much that discussion at the end kind of built on around ESG. That to us, I think, is amazing in terms of how much the industry has accelerated in terms of the adoption of ESG in the screening criteria and how much owners are putting that pressure on managers. And I strongly believe that it really is going to continue to be the owners that is going to be the key factor as to how quickly we get into a world where ESG really is the kind of central pillar as to how a firm is going around the management of the assets that they have. Um, and that to us is something that we are very, very focused on in terms of making sure that we're providing clients with the right data sets to do all of their ESG analysis, but then also building out analytics to enable people to make sure that their portfolios are being optimized in the most efficient ways possible, again, with ESG being the kind of central piece of it. And again, I'll touch on that in a couple of minutes time. Now, one of the things to us at Bloomberg that's incredibly important is this idea of, and Fiona and Howard both said it very clearly, but it's very difficult to find one firm that can really support you across the spectrum. Now, on the next slide, what we have is how Bloomberg is looking at the overall workflow of what an asset owner has. Now, we are continuously hearing from firms that they want to get away from that world of best and breed where they've sat there and gone out and bought, let's say, one provider that will solve for their risk, another provider that solves for performance calculations, and another provider that's the fixed income EMS, and they've got another provider that's the equity EMS. And to, to use the analogy of spaghetti, that's exactly the challenge that these firms had, right? They were trying to connect so many of those different bits and pieces together. Now, we are very, very much focused on making sure that we are giving you that solution going across what all of the front office needs are. So the portfolio managers, the research analysts, um, getting into the risk teams, and then giving you that true connectivity going down to whoever the back office and middle office providers are that you either outsource to or what you might be doing internally and giving you a lot of tools around automation. So Bloomberg is very much focused on delivering across these five different areas. We have product in each of those five kind of headline items that you see today, whether it's on helping you create that golden copy of market data Data, whether it's helping you reconcile your eyeball and then getting into all of the deeper workflows of kind of order management, getting into the kind of post-trade service space in terms of using a lot of technology for matching of trades, et cetera. We have always been delivering solutions across this space and we continue to provide our clients with these things either on a modular basis, but we also provide this as a truly integrated workflow so that firms don't have to worry about too much of that connectivity themselves and they can focus on what they want to be doing, which is the actual management of the money and generating the returns that they know they need to be driving for their end clients. Now, on the next slide, what we've done is we just tried to break this down in an even more bespoke manner. Um, for what the asset owner actually has. And we've taken that in those verticals of what do I do internally? What do I do externally? And then how am I starting to think about my alternatives as well? Now, I'm not gonna go through all of this uh, now, but we're very happy to have a conversation with anybody if they want to kind of have follow-up discussion on any of these specific pieces. But as you can see here, we're getting just more granular for the owner about the solutions that Bloomberg has today or the solutions that we can bring together to give you that kind of completely um, connected workflow going through what you might have as a firm. 
Now, the best example that's, that's an easy one to describe here is if you are running risk management across external assets and then you've got your internal managed book as well, all of that can then obviously be brought together to give you that true oversight. So you could drill down and say, right, I've got 20 external managers. We've got these internal mandates that are being run. What is my true exposure to, let's say, BP? Right, and you can very quickly get that drill down analysis. Um, so this is how we're continuing to respond of, of the needs of the asset owner. Now, the final two slides that I'm just gonna focus on is really what Bloomberg is thinking about in the future, okay? Now, our investment plan over the next few years is very, very much focused across these seven different areas that you see in front of you. Now, I'm not gonna talk through all seven of these, but again, very happy to pick any of this up offline with anybody individually. Um, but I'm just gonna reflect on a couple of these key areas of things that we've either been doing in that space or will very soon be releasing out to the marketplace. Now, the first thing I'm gonna to touch on is ESG. Um, as we say, ESG is gonna be a, a key, key pillar in terms of how the asset owners will continue to bring that into their investment horizon. Now, one of the things that's been of great importance to us is making sure that we are providing our clients clients with the best ESG data that we can either get our hands on or continue to create that, curate that data for our end clients as well. So at Bloomberg, what we've done is we've gone out there and we've either worked with third parties, such as let's say Sustainalytics, or in the last couple of months, we did a press release with MSCI where we've taken on all of MSCI's ESG ratings and scores and research on every single name so that you can see that through Bloomberg's application and still get access to all of the third-party content from MSCI. But Bloomberg is also very committed to using all of our own data whilst working with the third parties to go out and again create our own proprietary scores for ESG as well. Now we've initially released that on oil and gas companies and over the course of 2021 you will then continue to kind of see even more that we will be releasing in terms of Bloomberg's own ESG scores. The second part is around indices. Um, and again, owners play a key role in this in terms of either the benchmarks that they put down onto external managers or the benchmarks that you're using yourselves internally. Now, Bloomberg sits in a, a good position after the back of, off the back of the acquisition we did of the Barclays Brace business a little over five years ago, which has given the, the Bloomberg Barclays fixed income indices um, a, a much, much stronger footprint in terms of how we can continue to go out there and now provide our clients with multi-asset class indices, which again, I think is going to be something that's incredibly important for the owner as the owner looks to continue to generate stronger returns in a low interest rate environment. So today we sit here with very strong fixed income indices. We have some very strong commodity indices. There was a partnership between Bloomberg and UBS. So there's a, a very, very good offering on the, the commodity indices aspect. And then we've also recently started rolling out a number of Bloomberg equity indices, which actually started off with a US equity indice, which we did a partnership with State Street and State Street rolled out a whole blend of sub indices, which all had an ESG focus. Now, one of the luxuries to us, I think, of building equity indices today is we're building it off the back of the Bloomberg data that we sit on, but we're also making sure that ESG sits very, very much at the center as to how we will build out those indices. Now, the next example I'm gonna talk about brings ESG into risk and performance. Now, one of the things that we are increasingly hearing from both asset owners, but also from asset managers, is how do I sit there with my portfolio and enhance that portfolio to reduce its carbon footprint? Now, with Bloomberg, with all of the data that we sit on, we're in a position where a, a firm can sit there and have its portfolio, and the portfolio manager might be sitting there just looking at the basic construction of that portfolio, but that we can take that portfolio, run it against one of Bloomberg's risk models, and then we can actually come to you and give you recommendations as to how you can optimize that portfolio to bring down the overall carbon exposure or carbon footprint that you might have. And that's just kind of one example of how we're taking data from different places and bringing all of that together and running it against an analytical engine to then give the portfolio manager or the person that's wanting the oversight the ways that you could actually then work with that portfolio to bring down what the carbon exposure is. But this is the value that we think that we will be bringing to firms by bringing all of that, all of their positions into one platform to give that kind of true integrated 
experience as to how they can actually get the most out of the data that they sit on. Now, they're the three that I just kind of wanted to focus on with the interest of time. Um, but the final part I'll mention really reflects on a point that Fiona made was around regulation as well. Um, regulation to us is, is key. We were always at the kind of the forefront of MIFID started to be rolled out across Europe. We made sure that we were providing all of our clients with solutions to help them address uh, MIFID from whether it was a trade reporting angle or from a research angle as well. And research will continue to bring in the whole ESG piece as well. So that is something that you will continue to see more and more from Bloomberg on in terms of how we help all of our partner clients to make sure that they are dealing with much of the regulatory burden that sits on as possible, which as Fiona said, is just something you need to solve for. It comes with costs, but you just want the most efficient ways of being able to solve for it and solve for it with a partner that you can trust. Now, the final slide that we have here plays into the point that again both Howard and Fiona spoke about which is really around the, the workflow of LDI and ALM. Now again this is something to us where it's always been something the industry has been looking at and been very very fo focused on solving for but it's something to us where we feel that there are things that firms are going to be able to do in completely new ways and that really comes to the whole point that Howard was making around you need very open access to data. And one of the things that Bloomberg has been working with a number of our clients on recently is giving you much more programmatic ways to go in and actually get your positions or get your positions with derived Bloomberg analytics. So e.g. using programmatic language to come in and say, OK, I want my portfolio, but I want to run it against this scenario. What happens if interest rates move by 50 basis points? Well, that specific curve shifts under this scenario. Um, or what happens if there is another market event, let's say, like the Greek financial crisis, what would that be? So you can use programmatic language to come in, pull that data back down, and then build all that within your own custom applications. Now, the reason we say the custom applications is because I think more and more firms are wanting to use technologies like Tableau or Microsoft BI to build very good dashboards so you can graphically represent the data of both the liabilities that you might hold or what the income streams that you're going to hold or you're going to be getting off the back of the assets that you, you actually sit on. What do those cash flows look like? How do they match up against it? So that's just another example of how we're continuing to react to how the market's changing of the fact that people want programmatic ways of doing things and people are wanting to kind of use internal applications to kind of give more bespoke ways of how data can be sliced and diced. I'm going to pause there just out of the interest of time and I know that Sonia wants a bit of time left at the end for kind of Q&A but we really hope that just kind of gave a number of the people on this call a bit of a deeper perspective of how Bloomberg is here to help many of these asset owners go on this journey of getting much greater oversight of their portfolio and taking Bloomberg that step further than it just being the terminal access that many of our clients are utilizing us for today. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, Sonia, do you want to um, come in if there's any further questions? I have one quick question. I think we've just got about enough time to, to put it to you. Um, credit risk in the current economic climate is obviously of great importance. Can you please explain how your offering differs from the credit rating agencies? Indeed, yeah, it's an interesting one, and that again has been a, a question that certainly since the whole uh, the whole situation of coronavirus started, we've had more and more clients asking us around credit risk. Um, as I touched on with the, the Woodford example, I think that was a point where the whole debate around liquidity risk really grew from. Um, so credit risk to us is is something that we have been working on a solution for over a decade in terms of how we can continue to provide clients with a different way of looking at credit risk. Now, what we've done is we've used a much more mathematical approach towards it and kind of built out our own models. And the real beauty of this, instead of it all just being kind of very, very deep research based in terms of like a report being written, analyzing the company, going through all of these different parameters, this means it's much more of a predictive model. OK, now, one of the best examples that I can give you is some analysis that we actually did over the course of this year um, after we saw that kind of huge market sell off that happened um, in the wake of uh, the coronavirus kind of outbreak. Now, what we did is we looked at the S&P 500 and we took the 60% uh, or so of the companies that were downgraded by the likes of S&P, Moody's, etc. And we actually realized that the Bloomberg model to, to look at credit risk had actually given an indication on average 29 days earlier 
than any of those credit rating agencies had published saying, look, this, this company is going to be downgraded. So that is the kind of the beauty of using a modeled approach is because you are running the data every single night and you are therefore able to kind of come out and give a much, much more kind of earlier sign that the firm could have potential challenges. Now, it's a model, so no model is perfect, but as I say, it's, it's Bloomberg working with what we all have always done, which is working with market data and building out kind of analytical capabilities to give firms a much, much better understanding of credit risk. David, thank you very much for that. Well, Sally, we're coming to the end of our, our allotted time. Uh, so really just for me to thank very much Fiona and Howard for their insights, which we found very helpful. And obviously to Sonia for hosting the, the session. Um, and of course, then to you as well, David. And um, as David has mentioned, you know, please do follow up with, with Bloomberg. Um, you know, if you've got further questions and, and further information you'd like to glean from them, do please take the time to have a look at their other webinar. And um, all that remains is for me to wish you all a very Merry Christmas. And thank you very much for attending today. Have a good day. Take care.